Bye. Bye. Now it's just me all by myself. I couldn't shut him up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just couldn't shut him up. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. I don't know why I'm not hearing you guys right now. Oh, there we go. Did, yeah. Todd, did Todd just dump us into the lobby? Not sure. Yes, we, we are live. on air. We are on live. Uh, we are oh, on. Ben. I will apologize oh, first and ben. foremost for letting the last panel uh, run long. So thank you all for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks. Right. We'll be cutting a couple pages of the script, but just choose that arbitrarily. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Great reading. Bye, everyone. Okay, well, let's That's get it? going. Right. We, have, we have several of these coming up in a row, and we don't want all of them to be thrown off schedule. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here for the reading of Last House in the Woods by Vincent Delaney. Vincent is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter whose work has been produced across the US, Europe, Canada, and Japan. His screenplay, Kanan, was a finalist for the Disney Writing Program through the Blacklist, and his short film, Kuwait, was selected for festivals in Connecticut and Idaho. His plays have been produced, commissioned, and developed at theaters across the US and abroad. And joining us as our incredible industry professional is Gary Glushan. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. Uh, Gary is the executive vice president of F. Gary Gray's Phoenix Studios, where he oversees development and production of the feature film and television Slate. Phoenix Studios has a number of projects in development, which include the feature film Mask, as well as an adaptation of the popular video game franchise Saints Row. Glushan served as EVP of production and development for Fundamental Films, a China-based film financier, distribution and production company, and EVP of the feature film 24 Hours to Live, starring Ethan Hawke. He also served as Vice President of Creative Affairs at Will Smith's Overbrook Entertainment, where he was the executive on a number of feature films, including The Karate Kid, Seven Pounds, This Means War, The Secret Life of Bees, Hancock, and I Am Legend. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our actors. Uh, my name is Heather Pilder Olson, and I will be your moderator and your narrator today. And I'm going to have each actor introduce themselves. And let's start with Aaron Ray. Hi, I'm Erin Ray. Um, I'm a Los Angeles and Seattle-based actor, filmmaker, and I'm happy to be here today. I'm going to be reading Meredith and a couple other small parts. Um, yeah, I've worked with several of the other actors on this panel. I'm so excited to be reading with them, Erin Blakely and Angela. It's good to see Meg and Ben. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, and next up, Angela DeMarco. Hey, everybody, Angela DeMarco. Uh, I'm an actor, producer, filmmaker. I've been an actor on stage and screen for the past 35 years. Uh, Seattle-based now, and uh, my company and acting studio is Mighty Tripod. So check it out, look me up. But today, I am here all for Vince. All right, and then next up, we have Aaron Blakely. Hi, I'm Aaron. Um, I uh, am a, currently a Seattle-based actor who, uh, by way of Los Angeles, fairly recently, you uh, may have seen me in The Man in the High Castle, where I did three, three seasons recurring, and, um, and also on stage in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, and Seattle for the past several years. So I'm happy to be here, too. Thank you. Awesome. And then we have Meg McLinn. Hi there, I'm Meg. I am an actor of stage and screen. I'm a singer and I'm a teacher of acting and voice and I'll be reading several roles today. Awesome. And then last but definitely not least, we have Ben Andrews. Hey guys, my name is Ben and uh, I'm with the Seattle Film Summit, but I also like to uh, moonlight as an actor or a director, producer. Um, so I've been doing the summit and I begged the green room to let me in to read one of their scripts and also hang out with Gary. Good to see you, Gary. 
All right. Uh, so the way this will work, we're going to have Vincent tell us a little bit about the story, and then we will launch into the reading. And then right after the reading, Gary will offer us his feedback. So Vincent, let's start with your pitch. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you so much. You know, I'll just, just say briefly before I do that. Um, yeah, I've been a playwright, you know, all of this time, uh, a very long time. And uh, I just in the last couple of years got hooked on screenwriting and I've just really been kind of only doing that the, the last couple of years. And uh, this is my second feature. And it's the, it's the one where I feel like I'm starting to find a voice that's different from what I do in, in theater. And uh, it's been really weird and surprising because my plays tend to be comedies. Uh, they tend to be historical comedies. And this is a very bleak uh, thriller. And uh, I can't quite figure out why that's happened other than that. Uh, you know, I think it's just a guilty pleasure. Like if I'm going to go see a movie for fun, it's going to be the Babadook or it's going to be Get Out or it's going to be something like that. And so uh, I think I'm just sort of uh, enabling that, uh, you know, <laughs> that inner desire. So um, <clears throat> Last House in the Woods, it's a story about obsession. Uh, our main character, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, is, a, is a widow and single mom named Bree who has been devastated by the mysterious death of her husband, uh, David, four years ago. So she just, she just can't let it go. She lives in this house, it's deep in the woods, it's way too big for her. And uh, she's turned it into uh, a shrine for her husband. Her son, Jack, has serious trauma, which her fixation is not helping, but Jack has a bigger issue. At night, there's a shadowy figure who watches him from the woods. Um, leaves him present, seems to be hiding in the house. So Jack is convinced that this is his dad watching over him, uh, but he keeps it all secret from his mom. So there's this creeping dread about the house that we just feel vividly right from the beginning, like, like there's someone living in their house who's sharing their lives. Bree loves her son fiercely. She would do anything to protect him. Uh, she's very successful. She's a photographer. Uh, her studio is thriving. Everyone around her wants her to move on, but she just can't do it. Her, <clears throat> excuse me, her sister Meredith um, badgers her into dating Meredith's old college friend, a guy named Ewan, who turns out to be kind, he's gentle, he's a shy widower himself. Uh, he's also not ready to move on, but they click together, they bond. Um, Jack connects with Ewan and suddenly he seems so much healthier, like this could be a surrogate dad. And we start to hope for this new family that's forming. There's a sense that they're all going to escape, but things get worse. Bree discovers signs that her husband might be here stalking her. Cameras hidden throughout her house, money that isn't hers, weapons. She, uh, she uncovers a truth about David's past. He was secretly some kind of spy. Then everything explodes. Bree's <clears throat> sister is nearly killed in a hit and run. She goes into a coma. Ewan is attacked and badly injured. So Brie realizes she's got to get them out of the house, like right away, like now. And just at the moment when this new family is about to escape to safety, when we think they're gonna make it and start over, it all falls apart. Her sister comes out of her coma, frantic to reach Brie. The man Brie is dating isn't Ewan. Ewan is dead. He was murdered the day Bree was supposed to first meet him. The man she's sleeping with, who's becoming a new father to her son, is an imposter. He's a total unknown, <clears throat> and he's got Jack. So the third act is a desperate race to save herself and her son, but it's also a descent into obsession for all of them. Ewan was David's partner. He killed her husband. He stalked Bree from the beginning. But Jack is convinced that this is his true dad and will do anything to protect him. So thematically, what makes the story so disturbing, I hope, is not just that Brie has to save her son's life. She has to save his sanity as well. And the cost of that just turns out to be impossibly high. So there's my setup. And, and let's listen to the first act. All right, here we go. Exterior, wedding pavilion, Seattle, day. A wide lawn, golden sunlight, trees nearby. Two dozen guests smiling at a stage. A bride and groom, late 40s, both on their second marriage, but loving every moment of this. Strum of a ukulele. 
The minister turns, smiles. Off to the side, two seven-year-old girls, shy but determined, clutching their instruments. They launch into Nat King Cole's classic, Love. L is for the way you look at me. O is for the only one I see. V is very, very extraordinary. We roam through it all, taking it in. The couple, the beaming guests, the girls starting to hit their stride. In the trees, down low, hidden in the brush, through a telephoto lens, the wedding photographer filming the girls. The telephoto zooms, the photographer's face. She's young, confident, smiling, no idea she's being watched. The camera shutter clicks in rapid fire, spying. Breeze studio, day. The wedding video plays on a monitor, the two girls singing. The photographer leans in, playing with the audio. This is Brie Malcolm, 36, smart, self-possessed, successful. A tightness behind her smile, but she's good at hiding it. Behind her, the bride and groom, casual dress, grinning as the video plays. Oh my God. It's so good. How did you do it? No, it's it's not me. It's it's them, your girls. They're, they're naturals. I, know. I really think they might be. Reception, same. A boutique photo salon, upscale, urban. Breeze work covers the walls. Wedding portraits, modern, tasteful. Three photographers at workstations. Bree leads the couple to the door, holding a package. Three copies. Burn as many as you want. Give them to family, friends, but no YouTube, no oversharing on Facebook. Oh, we wouldn't. No, no, no. I, I know. It's just this is my little privacy speech. Your girls are beautiful and we have to protect them. That was my speech. <laughs> you're amazing. Oh, your family is amazing. I just take pictures. They take the package, Brie watches them leave, smiling. Her smile fades. Cliff top, same. Highway, sharp turn, a steep drop off that plunges 50 feet into the sound. Brie climbs out of her car, stares out at the water, not wanting to do this, but needing to. No guardrail, a sheer cliff, tumbling down to jagged rocks. She gets close, too close, stares out at the sky. How are you? How's your day? She looks down, the surf pounding the rocks far below. Sound of a police siren, growling. Same night, flashback. Police lights strobe across the highway. Three cruisers block the road. Cops and EMTs on radios, looking over the cliff. Bree's car races up, stops just behind the barricade. She stares, not comprehending. The cops turn, look at her, concern, pity. Same, present, roar of the surf below. She stands at the cliff, her cell buzzes. Alternative school, day, an old building out of place in the sea of McMansions. Tell me what happened. Principal's office. Jack Malcolm sits on a beanbag chair. He's eight, quiet, not necessarily defiant, but somehow different. Maybe it's the steady appraisal in his eyes, too watchful. He's holding a journal pressed to his chest like armor. Voices outside the half open door. He won't let it go. The consulars are trying. We just need more time. Jack creeps to the door, peers out. His mom stands in the hall. Leanna, 50, blocks her path. It's not healthy for his classmates. What does that even mean? It means he needs help that we can't provide. So where do we go? Honestly, where? Just just anywhere but here, is that it? It's delusional behavior. You <laughs> know that. He attacked a child. I want to see him. Now. They turn toward the office. He ducks back to his chair as they enter. Bree smiles. Hi, honey. You got off early. Hey, did, did something happen? They lied. They said my dad is dead. Bree knees ne kneels next to him, worried. I don't like liars. Bree's car. She drives, Jack in the back seat, clutching his journal. She watches him in the mirror. Bree's house. It's deep in the woods, tall pines, shadows, neighbor houses a long way off. A creek gurgles under a wooden bridge. The house is old, weathered, too big for them. A detached garage off to the side, doors padlocked. 
The car pulls up, crosses the bridge, pulls into the house. In the trees, a silhouette, watching. Dining room, Jack and Bree eat, silent. He's sketching in his journal. On the table next to him is a small stuffed bear positioned to watch him work. Are you going to let me see? Maybe later. Well, Darwin gets to see. This isn't Darwin. It's Sir Isaac. Oh, oh, well, hello, Sir Isaac. She leans over, playful, pats the bear. Jack closes his journal. Jack, it's just me. Outside, night. We're on the wooden bridge, watching the house. The creek gurgles. The trees peer down, thick and silent. Upstairs, a light winks out. Soft crunch of gravel. We move quietly to the front door, twist the knob, locked. Moving slowly around the house, a pile of toys covered with moss and leaves, abandoned. A waiting pool, blown against a tree, shredded and forgotten. A pie, a single window, lit. Jack's room, a row of bears lined up on the windowsill. Jack scoops him up, climbs in bed, Bree tucks him in. Who gives these to you? Your teacher? It's secret. Do you know how much your dad loved you? A lot. And I mean a lot. A lot. I know. If he could be here, he would. He'd be so proud of every little bit of you. He didn't leave because he wanted to. He didn't leave. Jack. He hugs her with one of his bears. Don't be sad. Honey, you need to listen to me. From outside, a heavy scratching, like a hundred fingers running on the wall. She's startled. It's just branches. <sighs> I know. She hugs him tight, goes <clears throat> to the door, hesitates. Closed, please. I'm okay. She doesn't want to shut the door, finally does. She's gone. He jumps up, opens the curtains, lines his bears on the sill, facing out at the night. Rustle of branches against the house. He sees something outside, down below, grabs his journal. Outside, we move to the detached garage, tug on the heavy chain, sign of, the, of a padlock clicking open. The chain falls into the dirt. The big doors squeak open. Hallway, Bree alone at a closed door. She opens it, a master bedroom, empty, immaculate, bed untouched. She stares, can't make herself go in. Stop, I said stop. <laughs> Master bedroom flashback. David Malcolm rolls on the bed, Bree pinning him down, laughing. He's 40, friendly eyes, beard, youthful. Let me go. No. Let me go. <laughs> no, I don't want to. <laughs> he spins, gets on top, face to face, both breathing hard, holding her hands pinned together. Do not tickle me. I won't. I'm serious. I'm very ticklish. I promise. He lets go of her hands. She tickles him hard. He rolls away, <laughs> laughing, crawls onto the carpet. She hangs out over the bed, grinning down at him. Your turn. Okay. <clears throat> Two lies and one truth. You kidding me? That's my game. Two lies and one truth. Fine. Go. When I was a kid, I burned both pinkies on the stove. I just bought a new camera. I'm pregnant. She sits up, shocked. Her face, her face gives nothing away, staring at him. She nods at the dresser. An expensive camera sits there still with a price tag. She laughs. He exhales, terror fading, tugs her onto the floor. Don't you ever, ever. Sorry. Jeez, my God, God. He presses close face to face. It's a used camera. That's not new. She holds her pinkies up to him. One of them has a scar. I only burned one of my pinkies. Those are the lie. He gets it, she's pregnant. His eyes go wide. She searches his face. Does he want to be a dad? Hallway, present. She stands, staring at the empty room, clicks the door shut. Bree's bedroom, cramped, cluttered, single bed, thumb drives, cameras, lenses, a desk, bottle of wine, laptop. 
Bree comes in, pulls out a prescription bottle, shakes out two pills, grabs the wine to wash them down, sees herself in the mirror, does not like what she sees, sets the wine down, pulls the pills out of her mouth, tosses them in the trash, collapses on the bed, stares at nothing. An old fashioned answering machine, red light blinking, he taps it. Hey sis, it's your birthday. So I don't know why you won't call me back. Kind of rude, isn't it? I got you a present. His name is Ewan Davis. I've known him since college, single, cute. Now don't get mad. Are you mad? He's up for coffee. Just coffee, Brie. Brie slams the answering machine into a wall, grabs the wine, chugs it, furious. Jack's room, he stands at the window, sketching. He's drawn a hooded figure, hidden face, peering up at his bedroom window. Impossibly long arms, a young boy looking down. Outside, mammoth trees like dragons, still and watching. Across the drive, the garage doors hang open. The front door of the house opens. Jack is there, clutching his journal. He steps out. There's a new bear in the middle of the drive, waiting for him. Bree's office, day. Bree, working, sell at her ear. Ewan Davis. He's a lawyer for the ACLU. There's no pressure. It's coffee. I have to go. Bree? Bree, there's a problem. Saida at the door, photographer, 30, warm, friendly, concern <clears throat> on her face. Uh, hold on. I'm serious. It's urgent. I'm almost Bree. done. It's bad. Reception. Lights are out. Bree follows Saida, puzzled. Wait. Wait, what, what is it? The lights click on, a surprise party, streamers, banners, balloons, photographers smiling, holding a <sighs> massive cake. Garrett steps forward, 60, kind face, heavy set. One, oh, two, three. You don't. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear <laughs> oh, Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. They hug her, laughter and cheers. She's overcome but hides it, smiles. Bree's office, a piece of uneaten cake. Bree working, soft tapping. Saida. What are you doing? I'm just, it's your birthday. I just need to finish. Ah, stop it. He snaps the laptop shut. It's okay to do something for yourself. It is. I know. I know. Come. One sec. Saida goes, Bree opens the laptop, looks to see she's alone, brings up a website, the ACLU homepage, employee directory, there he is, Ewan Davis, 40, kind eyes, goofy smile. She hesitates, intrigued. Well, this is interesting. She clicks out fast. Garrett comes in, holding a tablet. Oh, you need to see this. Holds it out, an Excel sheet, expenses, and income. What's the problem? Uh, I've done the math four times. Three, there's 100,000 extra. There's... I can't find the source. Somehow we have a hundred thousand we shouldn't have. <laughs> well, I mean, that's wrong. Somebody got sloppy with the numbers. Bree, this is our bank statement. The money's real. <sighs> Hell of a birthday present. Um, I'm calling the bank, right? You're calling the bank. Bree's bedroom, night. She's in bed, browsing Ewan's profile. Pictures with friends, elderly parents, a cute Scottish terrier. She taps a video clip. Ewan skiing, taking a tumble, coming up, laughing. She can't help it. She starts to laugh. A sudden scratching from the hallway, like the pine trees against the walls. But this is inside the house. She slips to the door, opens it. Silence. Jack? Honey, is that you? Down the hall, the door to the master bedroom hangs open. Master bedroom, she comes in softly, clicks on the light. Jack? Something's wrong, the bed is unmade. Someone's been sleeping here. But honey, are you in here? On the nightstand, a row of portraits. David and Bree at their wedding. Jack is a baby, his first birthday. David and a three-year-old Jack in matching Seahawks caps, holding a puppy. She picks this one up, smiles. 
Flashback, David dances around the room wearing the toddler Jack on his chest. Cheesy 50s rock, loud, Bree in the doorway. Are you kidding? He doesn't hear her. She watches him a moment, impressed, clicks off the music. Hey, come on, what are you doing? Too loud. Are you sure? They look down at Jack, he's starting to whimper. My boy knows his music. <laughs> David turns the music back on softer, Jack grins. You're ruining him. He's got taste, what can I say? <laughs> You're home early. Oh, work is fine without me. Missed you. She kisses him and it lingers, sudden buzzing coming from David's pocket. Uh, I should take that. He unstraps Jack, hands him to Bree, goes down the hall. She smiles, turns away, turns back. On the nightstand, David's cell phone. Does he have a second phone? She picks it up, mystified. It's his. She peeks down the hall. He's whispering, angry, pacing, face contorted, furious, not the man she knows. Abruptly, he slams the wall hard. I fucking know that. He looks up. Their eyes meet. Same, present. She sets the photo down, looks at the empty room, clicks the lights out. Jack's room, Jack's in bed, the row of bears on the sill, standing guard, his Seahawks cap hanging on the wall. She creeps to him, journal clutched in his arms. She reaches for it, feels guilty, stops. She goes, shuts the door. She sees his eyes snap open, outside, morning. Bright sunshine through the trees, bird song. Bree comes from the house. It's time. Honey, it's time. She looks around, no Jack. Walks to the detached garage, the chain lying on the ground. She touches the doors, they swing open. Garage, dim shadows, a car under a gray cover. It, Jack, are you in here? He steps to the car, hand grazes the cover. Her face crumples, a memory she doesn't want comes flooding back. She's out fast, slamming the doors shut. Darkness, from under the car, soft whisper of laughter. In the forest, Bree scrambling along the creek, panicked now, deep woods, a neighbor's house just visible. Jack? Jack? She stumbles out of the woods, frantic. Jack, sitting on the bridge, feet dangling, watching the trees. Jack! He races to him. Where were you? No answer. He's staring at the woods, fixated. Honey, what are you doing? Watching Dad. You know... Sometimes I'm sad. You know, sometimes I'm really, really sad. He's right there. She nods at the forest, dark, sh he nods at the forest, dark shadows, impenetrable. Is something there watching? Jack, go get in the car. She steps into the shadows, the world goes quiet. She peers into the dark, steps behind a tree, nothing. Freeway, day, Bree's car merges into the express lanes. In the distance, the mountains rise, covered in snow. Meredith's patio, big suburban backyard, an indoor pool inside a plexiglass <clears throat> shell. Bree and Meredith sip wine. She's 33, easy humor, caring. From the pool, laughter and splashing. How's work? It's good. I'm hiring. Fucking awesome. You wanna <laughs> hire my husband, teach him to sweep? Huh, how's his work ethic? Meredith <laughs> snorts, they watch the kids from home. Your family. I miss you. I know. You're just hiding out in that awful house. After everything that happened, it doesn't make sense. You have got to move on. I know. I just I know. How's Jack? He's, we're working hard. Honey, I'm so sorry. Meredith hugs her. The world sucks. It fucking sucks. And I'm making it worse. <laughs> Stay for dinner. We'll park the kids in the playroom. Stay. Okay. And if you don't want to meet this guy... No, I, I do. You do? I texted him. We're getting coffee. For real? <laughs> Fuck yeah! <laughs> he's, he's shy, okay? He's a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Don't you dare stand him up. Promise? Promise. Screaming from the pool, a young girl presses her face against the plexiglass, shrieking in terror. Anna? What is it? Anna! Pool, Meredith and Bree race in. Jack is waist deep in the water, calmly holding a 10-year-old boy at the bottom of the pool, drowning him. Legs wrapped around his head, using one arm on the side of the pool for leverage, utter calm on his face. Jack! Jack! She and Meredith rush at him, pull at his arms, but he pushes out to the middle of the pool, still holding the kid down. Get off him! Meredith leaps into the water, pulls at her son, gets her hands around his face and chest and brings him up. Jack watches, calm, not resisting. She drags her son out of the water. He's not breathing. Connor? Connor? And suddenly he is. Huge, rasping breath sprawls <sighs> over the edge of the pool. Oh my god, oh my god! Everyone looks at Jack. He climbs out of the far side of the pool. Suddenly he starts to sob, realizing what he's done. Body shaking. Get out. Go. Meredith. Just go. Go. Bree's car, night. They pull off the road, over the narrow bridge, into the house. She switches off. Silence. Stares at nothing. He called me a liar. He... He said, how's it feel not having a dad? I said, I do have one. He called me a liar. And that's why you... My dad watches me. I am not a liar. He watches me. Mom, he's here. Jack goes into the house. She can't move. Her eyes go shut. I can't tell you. Stop asking. Thick woods, day, flashback. Bree follows David down a trail, walking fast. I have a right to ask. We're safe. That's all I can say. The CIA? You never told me. I mean, what do you do for them? Bree, I, I can't... You lied to me. I didn't lie. What about Jack? Is he safe? Is our family safe? Yes, I promise you. I see you out here in the woods for hours. What are, what are you looking for? What are you afraid of? Nothing. They step from the woods. The house looms up above them. David stares at it, scared. She holds him tight. I love you. You have to trust me. Bree's car, night, the present, her eyes open. In the mirror, out in the yard, a figure stands watching her. He steps out into the night, cautious. Trees loom down at her. The brook trickles. No one. Hello? Who's there? She spins slowly, deep shadows. Anyone could be hiding. Something moves in the deep woods. Hey, hey! She shines her cell phone. Silence. It's gone. Bree's office, day. She's on her cell, pacing. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know we dropped out of counseling. I know that, but Jack needs to be seen. No, not next week. Now. I'll, 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 um, I'll call you back. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I, I, I should have knocked. What's up? Well, uh, I spent an hour with the bank. It's not an error. Money was wired yesterday morning. Wired? They can't trace the sender. Uh, how is that possible? No one knows. No routing, no account number. It, it, it should be impossible. We have to return it. Bree, no one knows how to do that. Silence. Her cell chimes. She checks it. Are we, are we involved in something I should know about? I have to go. Bree. She's gone. Downtown street, Bree pushes her way through heavy crowds. Something trips her. She stumbles. Oh! Larry! No! Larry! A Scottish terrier pinned between her legs. Its leash hopelessly <laughs> tangled. I am sorry. I am so, so sorry. Larry! Ewan runs up, kneels, fumbling at the leash. Lean, kind eyes, totally embarrassed. He loves mayhem. I, 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 I've just got to learn. <laughs> it's, it's okay, really. He stands, looks at Bree. His face falls. Oh no, you're Bree, aren't you? Hi. <laughs> Should not have brought the dog. Oh, it's... In the park, they walk Larry along the path, holding coffees. How long have you known my sister? God, since college. Mm. We were both in the same dorm. Oh, so did you two... No. <laughs> I mean, no, no. I, I was 
too much of a word nerd to you know um meredith was was a total party animal i was gonna say socialite but sure <laughs> those were crazy times not for us nerds we're having some troubles uh, me and meredith i don't know if she told you i'm sorry I, I wasn't going to come today i didn't didn't want to be rude oh okay um well, I'm glad you did. Larry tugs on his leash. Larry. <laughs> I didn't want to bring him, but my mom is rehabbing her hip. I mean, she can't even watch her own dog. Did she have a fall? Bad one. She claims it wasn't Larry, but I have my doubts. This dog is a monster. She looks down at Larry, a picture of innocence. Seriously, walking insurance claim. <laughs> Larry whines to get moving. They walk faster. So, uh, a lawyer for uh, the ACLU? Boring. I think it's amazing. No, you're amazing. An artist? Oh, come on. I, I take wedding pictures. Uh, it's It's been so long since I... I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. This isn't right. What? You're so nice, but uh, I'm not single. I mean, I am, but, uh, geez. Um, I had a wife. I lost her. Oh. I, I thought I was ready, uh, but I'm not. I'm just not. I should go. No, wait. It's too soon. God, I'm useless. Ewan, you and you you don't understand. I get it. I do. More than you know. I'm wasting your time. Maybe I want to see Larry. Bree's car. She sits watching you and lead Larry down the street, a faint smile on her face. Later, night, she pulls down the drive toward home, Jack in the back seat. Stops the car on the narrow bridge, switches off, looks at the trees, dark, foreboding. Are we going in? Be quiet. What? I said, be quiet. He stares at her, shocked and scared. She's watching the woods, fixated, can't pull her eyes away. Mom? She bolts out of the car, sprints into the trees. Jack screams, alone. Mom, don't leave me! Silence. He breathes fast, terrified. Dark shadows surround him. Gurgle of water. Dark house. A long pause. Someone coming this way. It's Bree. She climbs into the car, breathing hard. His eyes panicked. You left me. You left me. No answer. She pulls into the house. And see. That was awesome. I mean... Isn't it awesome to just hear your words, Vincent, when they are brought to life by these incredible actors? Yeah, you never get used to it, that's for sure. So yeah, great work, you guys. Thank you. Well, let's hear from Gary, your thoughts uh, on this story. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now, and, and you already mentioned it, but I know for a writer, it must, it's, must be a surreal and vulnerable experience hearing your own words be spoken out loud. Um, it's a different, it's a different story than just sending a script to somebody to read. Um, so let me trying to kind of organize my thoughts, but I'll, I'll give you, you know, I'll start with some more general, I, you know, feedback, and then I have a couple more specific kind of, you know, things to run by you. And then I know, you know, the actors want to jump in as well. So feel free to jump in at any time or, you know, so a couple, couple, just before I even dive into specifics, the, you know, it's very well written. My, if as someone who, if I was looking at this to potentially buy or produce, one of my biggest concerns with the first act is 30 pages in, I don't fully know what the protagonist wants. Like, what am I rooting for exactly? And, and what the inciting incident is. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you know, normally in this type of movie, it'd be, I mean, and I'm not suggesting the cliche versions are, oh, they just moved into this house. 
it, it's unclear how, how long is the kid think he's been seeing his dad, you know, or how long do they feel like they've been watching? Has this been going on for four years? So, you know, it, it, it didn't feel like there was any, felt like this was par for the course for the past four years. Right. And so I was a little unclear on kind of what the stakes were as has things gotten worse. Um, I also, aside from a few lines, you know, you said in the intro, you know, about her having a hard time getting over this. It, I didn't read what, what's holding, what, what is the death of her husband four years ago? How is it impacting her? She kind of seems pretty well-rounded to me, except for her kid's a fucking monster. <laughs> um, she, she seems fine. Yeah, she drinks wine and take pills. That feels like a kind of, in my opinion, an afterthought in reading, you know, a thing, you know, she's got a good job. She seems well-liked. Um, and so, you know, I'd be curious to see, and maybe that all goes together with, you know, because I also was curious what prompts her to meet the, the dude at the end of the first act. I think there should be something more specific. Um, so, you know, and, and, and again, so I, I would really hone in on what is something more specific? I always, anytime I read a script, I'm always want to know, like the most important thing for me, I want to know what's the goal of my protagonist? What are the obstacles? And, and, and what, it, what can the person, the protagonist, what at the end of the movie do they do that at the beginning they either were not capable of doing or refused to do, right? And so I would I would lean into something more specific that is holding her back because of the death of her husband, um, rather than just being because again I didn't get the sense that she's having that hard of a time. There's just there are a couple lines here and there like us, oh, you know, when someone in the office says. You know, you should think about yourself for once, but she seemed, I read her as very well-rounded and, 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 you know, and that the son was really the one causing all the stress for her, you know, with his own thing. So, um, and, and then again, making it clear, again, there's just the stakes of what's, what's the, I, I was unclear how long this has been going on with regards to, you know, the, this, has the son been saying that, that he thinks the dad's been watching for four years? Um, or is this something more recent has started happening? Um, so, you know, and, and, and again, that, that would lead into just what would prompt him, her to go on this date, the, something, the stakes should be risen in the first act. Okay. That's so, great. Thank I, you. I, mean, I don't mean to be rambling, but I want to, I want to, I'll, I'll keep going because I do have some other thoughts I want to throw at you. Um, but okay. So, you know, that, that's something I would, you know, would think would be important. Um, I was a little, it is the, a couple things, and this is like logic, but I always read it. The money transfer, why would this and some of the other clues that we probably didn't get to in the script, are they tied to the husband in some shape or paid off later? Okay. Yeah, that's the goal, hopefully. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, Okay. You know, again, I had some ideas of like, hey, you know, is she not over the death of her husband? I don't want to sound crass, but like most people, even though it's like sad and awful, you know, four years later, you know, you know what I mean? Would be moved on. I would think either she is having some issues because something was a little weird about his death and that's what fucking she can't let go of. Sorry for the cursing. That's just how I talk. Um, and, uh, or, or she, you know, again, these are all the bad ideas, but hopefully bad ideas spark better, you know, good, idea. you know, maybe things were okay for a little bit and then she found something or she saw something and, you know, something is amiss, you know, later on and that, that is kind of crept back into her life. But I don't know, those are just, those are some ideas. Um, I'm, again, it's hard judging without having read the whole script. It felt like there's a lot of flashbacks Mm -hmm. um i'm not a fan of flashbacks generally but um i know it's important to establish an emotional connection to the dad but it felt like it was too many for me and they also felt too familiar in my opinion like you know i i didn't you know you say does he want to be a dad is like is that something that is ever paid off later like did he not want to be a dad mm -hmm. or is that just a human 
interact. You know, you know what I, mean? I was trying to get a sense of if that meant something or not. Um, so, uh, and again, I just, I felt, I, I felt that they were just, it took me out of it a little bit. I know they're important. Um, I also, because of what I said about, I didn't feel her being so impacted by his death. I almost wish the flashbacks were like through the kid's point of view. Cause he, he was the one I felt was so impacted by this, even though he wasn't alive for the first flashback. I, you know, he is so impacted as it's currently written he would be the one watching old home videos or looking at pictures and, you know, he felt more obsessed, you know, than, than, than me, uh, than her, that is. Yeah. Um, That's great. Thank you. That's really good. Um, file this under the bad idea category, but you know, I have young kids and they literally are setting up freaking iPad cameras and crazy shit to try and catch the tooth fairy or Santa Claus. If this kid's so convinced that the dad's out there, wouldn't he be trying to like set a trap or be inquisitive? And, and you know, I, again, I would lean into, especially since, so, so this movie doesn't feel too like 1990s, maybe play up more social media, all the crazy tech ring cameras out, you know, and, and those type of things, maybe play into that a little bit more, especially kids are, are more tech savvy than grownups even. So I would think when he wanted to try and like almost catch him or get him on camera. Um, again, it was a little unclear. Like, is he in your description, you said he's like hiding it from his mom. I, it, it felt a little uneven. Like, is he, cause then he would not even tell his mom that dad's still alive. Right. Like, is it a full on secret? You know, cause he doesn't want to upset his mom. It, it feels halfway. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I don't, is he, is he fully keeping it a secret or is he the kid saying like, no, 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 mom, every day, dad's alive. I saw, you know, he's watching us, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it I didn't understand the, his approach to his mom there. Um, you know, I did like some of your choices with just, you, you know, the kid telling her to close the door. Like he feels, you know, I, I, it's always the opposite in every movie ever. So, you know, it, it gave him a little bit of an added specificity and added, added layer. Um, okay, I'll keep going through. Okay. Um, these are more personal taste notes. I mean, I've, I've shared with you more of my like general, you know, from an aerial view, I think there's the most important things that, especially since the first act is so important in establishing the stakes and keeping the attention, you know, you, you really need to know like what, okay, what am I rooting for right now? You know, um, and uh, so personal taste, these you can do with whatever you want. I'd say the only, you know, again, you wrote, you craft these scenes very well. The one scene that if I was gonna say like, I would just take a full other stab at this scene, in my opinion, is the, uh, the, the date with, the, with, is it Ewan? Mm -hmm. it, it, it felt too over the top, like too, like too heavy handed how nerdy he's playing like i i i you know I, it just it, it it felt too that that's not really the way the world is especially now it's not so black and white anymore and so he just felt too self i wanted to punch him in the face and and also <laughs> and also and also i knew something would be up with him yeah that, yeah it's just not real even you know like it's not cool and nerd anymore you know what i mean so i just I, I would, I would rethink, you know, even with the dog knocking her over that the, the, the whole like logistics of that, I didn't buy any chemistry because he came off too, too soft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and even halfway through him being like, I, I'm not ready for this. I got to go. Like what prompted that? You know what I mean? Like some, something more specific should prompt that at least artificially to him. But yeah. I don't know the whole, again, the whole dynamics of him. Cause we want to, at that point of the movie, we want to like him and root for her, you know, be excited that she has feelings. And so again, I just, it felt like a whole performance. Okay. Um, okay. One other, this is a small, two other, okay, these are small things. I'm going to hand it over to the actors. I, I hate redundancies ever when I'm reading scripts and it felt the two times Jack like 
beats the shit out of kids, one at school at the beginning, and then one in the swimming pool. It, it, it was for the same exact thing. You know what I mean? And I know it should be really related to dad, but it, it felt a little coincident. Like, who, kid, is that what kids do? Just be like, your dad's dead. And then, and then a totally separate kid. Like if it was one bully at school that always messes with him because his dad's dead, then it would make sense. It felt like there are two different incidents and it's the same, it's the same, I, I, I mean, and, and, and again, maybe there's a way to just be more creative with it. Like a kid, at, I mean, bad idea time, but you know, a kid at school, they were drawing pictures of their dad's profession or something and a kid in the class drew, I'm gonna go all dark, drew like a skeleton or a tombstone and wrote like the dad's, you know, just something to do, make it more visual and, and, and a little more clever and a little more disturbing. Um, Cause again, it just reads right now, like it's, it, that, you know, they just said his dad's dead and he says, no, he's not like, it, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, would, I would go for a little bit more of a, of a gut punch. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Especially if he's drowning a kid, kids got to say something a little bit more <laughs> um, than that. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, those are, those were overall. Sorry. I was just trying to type as fast as I could while you guys were doing it. Um, those were overall my thoughts, but I mean, the, again, I wouldn't focus. I mean, if you, if you are agreeing with any of these or any of them spark to you, I would worry about the bigger question first, cause that'll inform everything else. Right. Rather than changing the two Jack thing, uh, the two, like what the kids do to him to piss him off. I would punt that for a second. I would punt the date scene with you. And also, because you don't know what you got to figure out a little more of what her issue is because then the state will mean more, you know, it'll have a deeper meaning and you'll be more invested and you'll also be able to figure out what he should be doing. That makes her like find him, you know, rather than just being, you know, cause you just kind of leaned into him being really innocent for the most part. Yeah. You know, and, and, and not, and non-threatening. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I would focus on those, the, the, the first couple of notes I said about just the main points of the first act. And then that'll help, pay off everything else the only other thing i'll say and i don't want to this again this is very nitpicky and i sounds like it's tied to the third act i just i cringe when you when it, i read cia you know yeah. like or c i'm like yeah like it, it takes me out it's not a personal movie anymore about a, a family tragedy um and so i don't you know i don't know if there's a way to still craft some sort of mysterious backstory with him and we learn about a partner or an associate or something, but, um, or we hold it off later. But when I hear a flashback and it's a wife screaming, like you're in the CIA, like it, yeah. for me, it took me out of the story. And I'm like, what, the, yeah. I'm watching a different movie now. Um, so, and that's what I got. And yeah, if any of the actors want to, want to jump in as well, but ho hopefully, hopefully those are helpful. And I, those and are I, so great. Yeah. I speak with always take kind of just the spirit of the notes. You know what I mean? Make it your own, but always kind of take the general uh, spirit of it. So th that's great. Thank you so much for that. I will definitely go back and think about getting into the action. You know, what was really tricky for me, it still is, there's, for me, it's been hard to get over this stumbling block of if she's really not doing well, why would she go on a date with this guy? It just makes her look weak. You know, it makes her look like she's like trying to solve her problems by dating. And I mean, I know people do that, but I, I just got hung up on that. Like, well, do, and maybe the actors will have some ideas about that as and maybe it's not even a problem but that's kind of where i've been with that well wow. I mean, look she could be prodded much more even though she's at odds with her sister at the time but if again that's what i was getting at like the stakes are like she's in a bad place and she finally even it could be going on for one year or four years i think she needs to be in much worse shape where it's a it's a hit the you know bad idea and then we're not going melodramatic, like, oh, she gets drunk and passes out on the sidewalk or, you know, she's going to lose her kid. That's too much. But like, she goes on the date because she has a hit the wall life moment where like, she knows if I don't start turning things around and fixing things, we're going to be past the point of no return. That's why she goes on the date. Yeah. So you know, that's what I meant with like the inciting, what prompts her to go on the date. Something's got to happen to her. You know, it's not right now. It's all this, everything's happening to the kid. Something needs to happen to her where she feels uh, 
pressure and, and the need, you know, she knows if she doesn't turn things around for her and, and her own behavior is impacting her kid. And that's why she would go, that's why she would go on it. She's okay. going to give, fine. I'm going to give love a chance that, you know, this, this isolation is not, you know, is not doing good for our family. Right. I, I mean, that's where I don't, I don't know if it's okay for me to chime in here. Yeah, yeah. What Gary yeah. just said um, is exactly where, so I mean, where Gary mentioned the four years, Vince, that's kind of what I felt too, was this, I almost thought like the time should have been shorter, uh, having gone through personal loss. Um, I like now I'm in my fourth year. And like Gary said, it's like, I'm not saying I'm, Ooh, I'm yay. I'm great. But like personally, yeah, by the fourth year, there are some things that kind of fall into place for some people. So part of me, and again, with what Gary was saying, I like that so much shit is happening with Jack, but I, I think of it, my mom was a single mom, right? So I think of like what my mom had to navigate to, ha to raise her two kids. So if you have this single now with this single mom, this widowed mom, that my first gut was that he should have died more recently. Mm. All the Jack stuff can still be happening which think about that, like I've just lost my husband. Now, what the hell do I do with my son? He's doing this at school. And I felt like for the flashbacks, I'm kind of with Gary. I mean, I, I don't mind a flashback if it if it's it has to be there. But what if those flashbacks, if you kept them with her, are come after a Jack incident? So it's like this thing at school, boom. And I'm not saying she's going to think to kill herself, but that's kind of how you've written it, that she's there at that bridge where it possibly happened, but she's got to stay and keep going because of her son. Then he starts to drown this kid and there's this, right? But I think for the dating, I personally think there's something in that, and Gary touched on this too, I don't think work should be going well. If work is also like she can't fucking handle it, excuse my language, she can't handle work. Um, it's just all a little bit too much. Everything is piling up. They're throwing her a birthday party and she's like trying to just juggle all of that. That I could see her sister setting her up with this lawyer to help with work. And when she shows up to meet him, it's actually this blind date situation. Her si So like instead of making it a date... It'd be to me, and it might help a little bit what Gary was touching on with you and being such a nerd and such a goody goody that what if she's the one who throws the curveball? Yeah, so my business is struggling, and I, I don't know what kind of lawyer or what kind of stuff you do. My sister said you help small business, or I don't, and then he's like, oh, I thought this was a date. And it's like more of this, like, oh, 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 ooh, oh, right? Uh, whether Larry is there or not. But I did think that the son having those kinds of <laughs> dramatic incidents, that has got a way, I would think, way more on her. That I think, I mean, having with our own feature film, The Parish, my character lost her husband. She's drinking, she's popping pills. I agree with Gary. It's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the huge. And then it's the darker stuff that happens after that. Every, everyone drinks wine and pops pills these days. <laughs> right. right. And, and, and my, right. And my, and, oh, and that was the, the last little nugget, Vince, that, um, and this is also coming from, I'm thinking of our own feature where my daughter was doing these sketches, right? I also feel like there's a lot going on with Jack. You've got him doing sketches. You've got him getting teddy bears and you've got him drowning children. And I don't know if you need all of those elements. I don't, um, I know I got to see the full feature, um, but part of me was like, do you need the sketches too? And I started thinking more where Gary was thinking that the the camera, the social media, the, the ideas of like, is he also getting texts from Teddy Bear Giver? You know, if Jack is a phone you know, kind of a thing. Like, I, I think there is a shift unless you are in fact wanting to make this, you know, pre 2000, you know, mm -hmm. or something. But I think my biggest thing was that, um, yeah, I think, I think Brie can be in a, in a, in a rougher spot, in a rougher place. Cause I know speaking from my mom's own experience, when shit hit the fan with us kids, that would ultimately trigger her grief from the loss of my dad, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I think that's that's good feedback. Do any of our other actors have notes? I, 
I just want to say, Ari, your notes are so on point. Like you were articulating things that I couldn't quite put my finger on. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, so great notes. And Angela, I love your notes as well. I don't have a lot to add. I've just been enjoying this process. Um, some of Gary's notes were kind of making my little gears turn. And, you know, I could I could suggest little fixes here and there, but like, you got it. Like, I don't think I have anything of, you know, I can't really add anything. It's it's a great script though. And I'm excited to see you, you. keep working on it and see where it goes. I'm really so hooked on this idea that a, things are not going well for her. And B, she doesn't realize it's a date when she meets him. That's going to be so cool. And But he thinks it is because like sister's been sly, right? Because I, and I, that feels like I'll, I'll get past this sticking thing I've got in my head of like, why would she do this when everything's collapsing? She doesn't know she's doing it, which I really like. So thank you, um, both of you guys for that. That's a super good note. Uh, I'll just jump in quickly. Um, I am the uh, worst critic in the world because one, as an audience member, I always go in wanting to be swept away. Um, so I'm like suspending disbelief, no problem. And also as an actor, I was trained um, that the playwright is always right. When you get the script, it is perfect. And we must, so like every script I've got, I'm like, it's perfect. It's my job. So um, Vince, in first reading just this segment, I was just really drawn in. I want to know what happens next. So I will just say as, as somebody reading it and then hearing all the voices, I really want to know what happens with these characters. That being said, as I was listening to Gary give feedback, I'm like, oh yeah, that would all really help. Right. Um, I did feel um, overall that, uh, yes, I wanted to see more of a struggle in in our main character and know what, what she was really fighting for and fighting against. Um, but uh, outside of that, I just, I just really enjoyed reading and hearing everybody's voices. That's great. You know, the, the last thing I'd say, and this is, the hardest note I'm going to give you by far and, and most cop out general, you like, I don't have the answer at, at all. Um, but just, and you already know this, but there's so much content out there right now um, that you really need to, especially when I'm getting sent so many materials and, you know, speaking with people at the studios and the streamers and everything, there is a need to really be bold and stand out and be weird. That's kind of, that's, that's the adjective we, I use all the time. We want, we want weird. You know, if you look at some of the movies that came out last year, whether it's, I mean, the list goes on and on Jojo rabbit, a kid and Hitler are friend, like, and there's more, you know, even, I mean, parasite. I mean, again, even so, and if you looked at every one of them, you would be like, how the hell did they pitch that? And granted, some of these are very high level directors who have a little more rope to get weird stuff made. But I would just say that as you continue working on the script, and this is not big structural things, or even just look for any opportunity. When you talk about a mom and a son and a dead husband and a cabin in the woods, that and trees brushing on a window, it's impossible for that as a reader not to feel familiar. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. In many ways. And again, I'm not saying, oh, it shouldn't be in the woods or it shouldn't be a mom and a son. Don't, don't, you know, they call it, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't need to, re, you know, reinvent that. But look for opportunities to, and, and the hard, the hardest part as a writer is not just creating the shock value for the sake of shocking. It has to make sense. But that's why I was thinking of just even small things like the kid at the school. What's something where the audience would just be like, oh, shit, I've never seen that. Or that's that's twisted. You know, you know what I mean? Rather than just your daddy's dead. You know, you know, if there's a drawing or if the thing at, at the swimming pool drowning and uh, and instead of her drinking wine and doing pills, is there something a little more messed up? You know, again, it's hard because you want to keep her likable, but um I would just at any turn look look for ways to to be a little I'd say 
it's not the right word, but I really appreciate when I'm watching something and I can tell they put real thought into even a joke or a line or a scene. And so, and you know, and just until they, it's different, uh, but different, but not for the sake of being different. So that's just something I would, especially in this genre that you're doing, uh, you know, where it's not necessarily the highest concept, you know, going into it. It's not, you know, the first 10 minutes, it's not like, okay, I get it. It's, you know, 10 guys locked in a basement or it's, you know, whatever, you know, wh whatever the thing is, I would just, I would look for opportunities to be a little weird. That's my advice. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. That's great. Great advice. It gives, it I means it gives us so many ideas. It makes me think about my story and, and it's great to hear someone who can just like cut right to the chase with these notes. It's awesome. Um, ben, I want to make sure you have a chance. I think you were going to say something. It always sucks to go last because all the smart people have already said everything that you can say. Just say you agree with all of us and you're Great. good, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, truth being said. Uh, I just, I, I, I like this script. I've read a previous version of it, uh, Vincent. Um, and the only, I, I think I have more of a question, which is, and I think I told you this last time I read it, I spent the first 15 pages wondering if I was watching Baba Duke, an action adventure or a thriller with a, you know, with a killer. And, um, and so that was like where my brain was going. And it's like, okay, I, I want to be, I want to figure this out faster than anybody else. Is it a scary movie? Is there a monster? Uh, and I, I, is that done purposely? Because I, I think that affects some of the specificity that, that Gary is talking about. Cause I think the way I interpreted it was he's not being specific because he wants me lost for the first few pages. So I'm just wondering what your method was there. I do want that, but the more I'm, now I'm thinking that's gotta be merged with a character who's more driven. I think I can still do that. If she is, first of all, she's more messed up. That's fine. I love that. And she's pursuing something more concrete and specific. Then I think it's totally fine that we're like, is it a thriller? Is it horror? Is it in between? I, I do want that. I feel like that's where it, it could become really unique and interesting, you know, if I do a better job of that. Yeah, and I, I would agree. Uh, that was one of the things that I really did like is because it was like, I, I'm on a mystery and I'm, you know, when, when am I going to figure this out? That was an enjoyable experience for me. But I, I think that you're, you're hearing great input here. If you can make it a little bit weird, if you can punch up some of these scenes, remove some of the redundancy uh, you know, with the, and a little bit of the cliche with the bottles and the pills um, that you can still keep that. And I would encourage you to keep that because that was one of the things I, in your chain, in the midst of your changes, I wouldn't want to see that really unique ingredient go away. Right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that was really good, helpful feedback from everybody. I just yeah. want to say it, it's it's a little new to me reading narration, but I I was really happy to be able to do it for this script, and I'm going to do it again for a comedy in a couple hours. <laughs> and um, but you know, Vincent, I've always said this, but you're you're a very beautiful writer, and it's it's kind of a pleasure to read even just these you know few lines here and there. And I as I was reading it for the first time, it's like wow, that's such a pretty sentence. You know, this is these little descriptive oh. lines and it's, it's beautiful to read on the page. And it is a script for me that really drew me in. But at hearing all this, I mean, I really agree. You can raise the stakes, especially for Brie. You can make this more dire because the more you can keep an audience member or even someone reading it on the edge of their seat, the more compelling it's going to be, you know, especially with this kind of story. Um, but is it, you know, it's a pleasure to read. I, from the time that you applied to the green room, like you stood out to all of us, like this guy, pay attention to this guy because he's really good and things are going to happen for him. So um, it's cool to see you here doing this. And I look forward to what's going to happen with the script going forward. Um, does anyone have any last thoughts before we wrap up and move on to our next show? Well, I, I just want to say to everybody, thank and Gary, thank you all so much. That that kind of rocked my world. It was actually really great to get those notes. I actually think it's knock on what I don't think it's going to be that hard to do it, but I didn't know I needed to do it. So now I'm I'm super jazzed to come back to this. So I just thank you all. It's been really great, really, really, really productive. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gary, for being here with us. And thank you, Vincent. And to, thanks to all the actors. Thanks, everybody. Who thank you. Um, Hopefully, I'll be back out in Seattle next year. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully, next year we'll be in person in an actual room. Um, we have three more table reads coming up for those that are watching. You want to stay tuned Sunday afternoon. Just stay right where you are. We've got uh, the last house in the woods um, th that was we just did by Vincent. We have the next day coming up from Kristen Raven. We have Olympus Heights, which is a comedy from Brad Wilkie. And then we have my script, which is 38 minutes, which is a uh, limited series for TV um, coming up at 530. So uh, lots of entertainment coming your way. And uh, hopefully you'll stick with us and uh, we will we will keep you entertained for the rest of the day. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Be safe.